All right, hello again, everybody. Again, I'm Dr. Ed Levine, and I'm here to say hello from beautiful Wake Forest University. We have a local session from the Wake Forest team, and our first speaker, uh, Stephanie Thornton, who's actually been working with me, poor thing's been working with me for a number of years, taking care of high pec patients. And I think she's got some insight that she'll be able to share with you. We'll be talking more about, uh, more sort of a, rather than the scientific, I think we'll be getting down to more of the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty of how to get through the day. So I'm gonna slide off to the left and leave it. The day is yours. Thank you. Hello, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining our team and, and joining this uh, wonderful presentation that was put together by the um, Appendicil uh, PMP uh, Foundation. Um, I am going to start my presentation and we're going to go from here. Okay. Hmm? Nope. Let's see. Just click in ah. and then you have control. Click on the slides and then. All right. Well, I thought I did that. There you go. Um, I've actually been with the department going on seven years now. Um, prior to that, as surgical nurse for greater than 10. Um, I provide care for our patients in the clinical setting, daily support for patients after a, a cytoreduction reduction in high PEC. Um, and then I do follow up visits over those years. Those years, I'm, I have developed some standard recommendations for the most common questions and concerns. Um, so following a cytoreductive surgery and high pec, the body undergoes numerous changes. Um, some can be permanent and it depends greatly on the extent of what was removed during the um, cytoreductive portion. Um, what will be removed cannot precisely be determined prior to surgery. Um, a lot of our education preoperatively does center on the fact that there is a numerous uh, amounts of issues that can arise based on what is actually removed. Um, the basic functions of the most commonly um, organs involved in a CRS is the small bowel. It absorbs the nutrients, digestive enzymes from the pancreas, the large bowel responsible for absorbing water, electrolytes and forms and source species. The omentum, which is the adipose tissue, provides the limited peritoneum support, but it is not involved in digestion. The spleen helps control um, the amount of blood in your body and destroys old and damaged red blood cells. Um, the gallbladder assists with digestion and producing, storing, and transporting bile, which is produced by the liver. It is used to break up and digest fats in the small intestines. And then, of course, your pancreas assists with digestion and management of your blood sugar. 85% of the pancreas role is to provide digestive enzymes. Um, uh -huh. There we go. Um, other important health management issues for patients who have had their spleen removed. As I mentioned, the spleen helps to fight germs and infection. Living without a spleen is perfectly safe. The spleen's duties are taken over by the and shared between the liver, the lymph node, and the other organs. You should have received vaccines at the time of surgery and at your post-operative visits to help fight against um, the streptococcal pneumonia, meningitis B in conjugate, and the haemophilus influenza flu B. You should also be receiving a yearly flu shot and follow up with your primary care provider to get boosters with your measles, mumps, rubella, your diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus shots, and that you also, which would again protect you against measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, pertussis, polio, and tetanus. Boosters are suggested every three months um, from the time your spleen is removed. If the gallbladder is removed, foods that are high in fat will be more difficult to digest. There is a portion of the pancreas is removed. Digestive issues and controlling your blood sugar can also occur. Pancreatic insufficiency may require enzyme replacement therapy. Blood sugar can changes can be managed by your primary care provider, and it is recommended that a 
Um, hemoglobin A1C it once a year test is performed. This blood test provides a record of how your pancreas is able to control your blood sugar for the last three months. I do not understand why health for perimenopausal women who have had their ovaries removed, you should follow up with your gynecologist and discuss hormone replacement therapy. For most patients, hormone replacement therapy is safe. A DEXCA scan is recommended about every five years after your surgery if your ovaries have been removed. This provides information regarding the density of your bones. The younger you are at the time you lose your ovaries, the higher risk you are for developing osteoporosis. So this is very important follow-up. Mammograms every year beginning at the age of 50 is recommended. You can also follow continue with pap smears um, based on the guidelines unless a hysterectomy has been performed and discuss further with your GYN. Long-term health management is a priority for our patients. Weight management, regular exercise, high-quality nutrition, and a well-balanced diet along with proper hydration <laughs> afford excellent health management. Avoiding tobacco products and excessive alcohol use. We recommend a colonoscopy every five years. And for all fit appendicillin cancer patients, Regular yearly checkups with your primary care provider remains important. Oncology follow-up should not be in lieu of regular primary care visits, but should be a supplement to them. Long-term health management also includes doing all the things that make you happy. This provides for improved mental health management and creates lasting moments. The most important is routine follow-up with scans and blood work with your surgical oncologist, and this allows them to monitor you properly and provide the best recommendations as needed. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. More importantly, thank you for allowing me to be involved in your care and in this presentation today. I hope the information that I have provided today answers some of your questions and also gives you a framework to help manage with your overall health needs. Feel free to contact me or any of our team members should you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, great job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we have Monica, a uh, pre recorded session from Monica Moorfield. Uh, Monica is an inpatient clinical dietitian with Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. She has had experience working with inpatient HIPEC patients for over a decade. Um, if you could call up the recording, Arn, that would be great. Hello everyone. I'm going to talk about nutrition and high tech. I'm going to start with talking about pre-surgery. So before surgery, the goal is to maintain weight or gain weight if you're underweight. And if you're having trouble with gaining weight, we have a couple of great outpatient dietitians in the cancer center. Center, Wendy Watson and Emily Henderson are great. So, you know, communicate with your doctor and ask to see them if you want to try to help with that weight. It definitely would be good to um, get good nutrition before surgery. I am um, inpatient, so I don't see outpatients. And then some just general healthy, best food choices to eat are a variety of fruits and vegetables, get different colors, because that gives you different vitamins and minerals, different antioxidants, eat whole grains, legumes, nuts, eggs, fatty fish twice a week is, is a good goal. So salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardines, those are some fatty fish examples. 
and then low fat dairy. So they're getting a good variety of different food groups. It's going to help you get the different nutrients that'll that'll help. And then um, avoiding or limiting processed meats like. Sausage, bacon, lunch meats, um, limiting red meat to no more than 18 ounces a week. And to give you a frame of reference, three ounces is the size of a deck of cards. And then you also want to limit and avoid um, refined grain products. That would be the white stuff, the white flour, the white um, breads, pastas, crackers, that sort of thing. And limit added sugars. And um, supplement drinks may be helpful to help with weight, to help give you those extra nutrients that you need, boost, ensure, carnation of breakfast essentials are, are a few of those. And then sometimes people have partial intestinal obstructions before surgery. Sometimes that can even happen after surgery from adhesions and maybe even tumor regrowth. But um, this is the diet is not evidence-based. It is anecdotal. So there's no guarantee that following this particular diet that I'm going to talk to you about is going to prevent a full obstruction, but it still may help. Um, so limiting or avoiding insoluble fibers, that would be things like nuts but you could have smooth nut butters, like smooth almond butter, uh, peanut butter, that sort of thing. You want to limit and avoid seeds, skins or fruits and vegetables, raw vegetables. Um, we want your vegetables to be, just be well cooked. And then with when it comes to fruits, limiting um, or not doing the raw fruits, but bananas would be okay. And then other things like eggs would be okay, meats um, that aren't tough would be okay, um, milk and yogurt would be okay. So, but sometimes even avoiding or limiting the, the insoluble fibers that I was talking about may not be enough. You might need to do like a soft consistency diet or even like a puree diet. Sometimes you believe they need to do more liquid. Um, so just like blending things up completely um, might be more tolerated. And then there is a lot of concern out there about sugar. So I wanted to make sure and address that. Um, it's more added sugars that are the problem and people will take that as you should avoid, you know, people People think they, you should just avoid carbohydrates in general, but no, you don't want to avoid carbohydrates because every cell in your body uses glucose for energy, for fuel, just like a car uses gasoline. You know, the, of course, the cars that use gasoline, you know, they use that to run. They need that. So consuming a low or eliminating carbohydrates will cause low energy and cause your body to break down proteins instead and lower your immune system. Um, so choose complex carbohydrates like whole grains and um, fruits, starchy vegetables, and again, limiting the, the simple sugars, the added sugars. And then after surgery, your diet, um, you may have diet restrictions depending on what's removed in your surgery, but if you do have a specific restriction, it's likely that you should be seeing me and um, inpatient for me to talk to you about those restrictions. Um, in general, and after surgery, if everything goes well, if you have a bowel resection, then full liquid diet would start at day three, and then regular food would be by day four. If you don't have a bowel resection, then everything is up to day one day. So full liquids would be day two, regular diet would be day three. But again, this is if you're tolerating everything okay, not having nausea and vomiting, um, everything is going smoothly, then that would be the progression. And supplement drinks may be helpful. Um, once you're able to tolerate a diet to help you get the extra nutrients. So we do have Ensure a lot. We use that, Boosum too, and Carnation 
breakfast essential foods in patients. Um, there's things like premier protein a lot of people use, and that's fine to get extra protein, but it doesn't have a lot of um, calories in it. So if you're not eating a lot overall, there's other supplements like the Plus Ensure, the Boost Plus, that can help you get more calories in. And protein needs are definitely increased after surgery. You want to make sure you're getting high protein foods in all your meals and snacks. So high protein examples would be all your meats, your your chicken, your turkey, your fish, even the red meats. You just want to make sure and not have too much of that. Your nuts, your nut butters, your eggs, your cheese, your dairy, your milk, your yogurt, um, your legumes. All those are going to be high protein sources that are good for you to get. And then the benefits of nutrition after surgery, all of that will help with quicker healing time, less hospital length of stay, less chance of complications after surgery. So um, less infections, less chance of pneumonia, that sort of thing, and decreased chance of hospital readmission as well. And then I'm going to discuss some symptom management for symptoms that may occur before or after surgery. Um, abdominal fullness and bloating are, is very common. Um, ways to help with decreasing that is decreasing gas-forming foods and beverages like carbonated beverages, using a straw to drink because that can cause you to suck up more air. Talking while you're eating can cause you to swallow more air too, so being careful of that. And then avoiding gassy foods, the so things that you know cause more gas for you in general broccoli, cabbage, beans, those are just common gas-forming foods, but you should know what you have problems with, like before surgery, you know, just make sure to avoid any of those gassy foods after. And then eating, consuming small frequent meals and snacks can also be helpful for fullness and bloating. And if you have nausea, stick into more dry, starchy foods initially, so like crackers and toast, dry cereals, um, chicken noodle soup. It's also good and bland. You want to alternate your liquids from your solid foods. You want to avoid or dilute sugary drinks, even like juice, soda, regular Gatorade, all that stuff has a good bit of sugar in it. So especially on an empty stomach, I would avoid or dilute those. And consume, again, small frequent meals and snacks are good. Avoid um, taking pills on an empty stomach unless your provider tells you to. Take nausea medicine as soon as you first notice you have nausea to help get it under control. Rinse your mouth or brush your teeth um, prior to and after eating may be helpful. And then sitting up in a better chair for 30 minutes to an hour after you eat. And make sure you're staying hydrated because becoming dehydrated can make you feel nauseated. So sit the non-clear liquids every, 20, every 15 to 20 minutes is what we recommend. And then with diarrhea, um, consuming smoke. is the most common that I've noticed. Maltol, sorbitol could also be um, the sugar alcohol that's in those things. And then there's high sorbitol fruits. There are the pea fruits. There's the peaches, pears. Um, the pineapples and prunes are all high in sorbitol. So I would just limit those too if you're having diarrhea. And decrease sugar intake. So sugary... <laughs> Foods, foods with a lot of butter, cream, a lot of cheese that can 
um, that may contribute to diarrhea, and then eating some starchy stuff um, like bananas and white bread and white rice and mashed potatoes, oatmeal, crackers, those things can help too. And then if you do notice that you're having more diarrhea, bloating, and gassiness after dairy and dairy items like milk, um, ice cream, uh, pudding, cheeses, those things, it may be a lactose intolerance that you've developed. So you can always get the lactose-free versions of those foods or even getting a lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the lactose. Lactose is just the sugar that's in the milk. So the lactase will break it down. You can just get it over the counter pill and take it with dairy to see if that helps. And that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> nice job by Monica. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we had some skips in the audio there. Um, uh, Nathan, is Dr. Levin um, in the room or are we're queuing up your uh, presentation now? I'll yeah. introduce you if he's not. Uh, I, I see Dr. Levine sneaking in on the side. <laughs> okay. Go, 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 go right ahead, Tim. I mean, he's eminently well introducible. Okay. Um, so next speaker we have that we're queuing up is Nathan Ogilvy. Uh, he's a physician assistant with surgical oncology department at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist since 2010. So um, uh, Nathan, you can either click on the presentation and go through your slides, or if you'd like to have Arn do it, you can just say next slide and he'll take care of it for you. Yeah, I can click through them. Great. We all set? Yep. All, all right, set. let's get going here. Again, my name is Nathan Ogilvy. I'm one of the physician assistants at uh, Atrium Health Week Forest, and I mainly work on the inpatient side of things, helping patients recovery. So if you had a site of reductive surgery with HIPEC, we've probably crossed paths in some way, shape, or form. What I'd like to talk today about is enhanced recovery after surgery and inpatient, uh, improving patient recovery. We've talked a lot about um, in these presentations, a lot about the science of tumor biology and targeting tumors and patient specific factors that allow us to treat appendiceal cancer. But there, the science doesn't end there. It really also involves how patients recover after surgery. And I'd like to start by just congratulating and thanking all the patients that have recovered from this surgery because your recovery is being utilized to help other patients recover better. There we go. Um, so just realize that all the hard work that you've been doing to recover from your surgery is being noticed and it's being used to and being shared across centers that do HIPEC in order to provide a good evidence-based recovery. So what is enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS? It's basically a evidence-based multidisciplinary approach to standardizing patient care after a big surgery like a high pec. And it sounds really fancy, but it really just is an effort to reduce length of stay, reduce complications, as well as costs, and improve patients' experience with recovery. Um, there are five really key elements. And enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS is not something that is unique just to surgical oncology or to HIPEC surgery. It's something that's being utilized all across any surgical service. And what we're realizing is that following what is traditionally done isn't always best practiced. And so by looking at patient experience and what works, we're able to move patients safely and efficiently through that. All ERAS protocols will involve most of these elements, and so I'll just touch on each of these. And these, in essence, and they're linked together because they build on one another, and as one improves, we're able to move on to the next one. So ambulation or mobility, nutrition, um, how we handle IV fluids after the operation, how we handle pain medications using narcotic versus non-narcotic, as well as minimizing tubes and drains, really is the foundation of any ERAS protocol. Looking at those a little bit more specifically, getting patients moving and up out of bed. Unfortunately, all the things our mother taught us about us recovering has been wrong. Resting is not always the best thing and getting up and moving, a moving patient is a recovering patient. Um, early initiation of diet, not waiting until patients have official return of bowel function, but 
getting them started sooner we know stimulates things, as well as how we handle IV fluids. Most patients are surprised when they get home that they weigh more than when they came into the hospital despite not eating, and, and that usually is related to IV fluids, and that has an impact on how a diet is tolerated as well as how his patients are able to get up and about as, as any patient who's recovered from this operation knows there's a lot of extra fluid on board. And then use how we use uh, narcotic pain medications. That has always been an element of surgery, but now we're looking at new things that we can do to improve pain control without any of the deleterious effects of uh, narcotic pain medication. And then judicious use of tubes and drains, getting them out when they're no longer providing a benefit. And lastly, not necessarily unique to ERAS, but something that we've incorporated is early on in our HIPAC program, a lot of patients went to the intensive care unit, and that is great when you need it. But when you don't need it to be an intensive care unit patient, that is the worst place for you to be because being in bed is really where they want patients, tied down and uh, able to keep track of. And we know that if we get you on a specialized surgical unit that has expertise and nurses that know how to take care of HIPAC patients, it becomes a much more recovery-focused mobile environment. So we are also looking at how it is that we can move patients out of the ICU quicker or just avoid it altogether. So why do we look at those five elements in particular, and why do we develop protocols like this? Really, for a patient, this is your ticket home. Um, and if you look at all these elements, really here is a description of a patient that is ready for discharge, somebody who is up and about safely, somebody who's tolerating a diet and taking some fluids in, somebody whose pain is controlled with an oral regimen or their symptoms as well, and somebody that is having bowel and bladder function, then there's nothing else that we're concerned about or needing to be monitored. And by identifying these little tasks along the recovery pathway, it allows patients to be able to see where they're at in their recovery. We've all been on that trip with our parents at some point in our life, and the, the dreaded question becomes, are we almost there yet? And a lot of patients, when it comes to recovering, it feels like that. We come in every morning, we wake you up at the crack of dawn, and your first question is, can I go home today? And the answer is not yet. And by having an ERAS protocol where a patient can see where they're at in that recovery, we know is a big satisfier because you're able to follow along and you're able to see your discharge uh, coming closer and closer. So that's something that you can be a part of. And that's one of the things that excites us as well. This slide here looks a little bit about what that ERAS pathway looks like for appendiceal uh, HIPAC patients. And you see most of the things that I mentioned, the activity, the diet, the IV fluids, and pain control, most of those things occur within the first few days after surgery. And then the last few days, we're looking at kind of taking care of how to buff these things up and get them and to have that last day where we're kind of treating home uh, like you're at home. And so just so that we know we've got pain control working well, we know that tolerating a diet is good, and that will minimize the likelihood that you'll need to come back after a surgery. Our experience on average that we have published, on average, a patient stays about eight days in the hospital. That is improving as we've implemented some of these uh, recovery pathways in an effort to move patients along efficiently. The range of time that most people will spend in the hospital is anywhere seven to 10 days, but we'd like to look at discharge, not so much as a date on a calendar, but as accomplishing certain goals. And that's what these pathways enable us to do is share with you where you're at in your recovery. And then you can kind of help us stay accountable too, is why is my tube still in? Why is that IV fluid still hanging? I thought this was ready to get done. And that helps you and us to, to work together as partners in your recovery. So, the first element here, activity, that is the, the worst. So most patients, the dreaded day is we wake you up at 6 a.m. after surgery and it's time to get out of bed. And we feel we're doing this very gently, but patients don't always agree with that. But really, as I said before, getting up and out of bed is really one of the best things that you can do to recover from a surgery. We know that the more days that somebody spends in bed, and Garfield's always a good example of somebody who wants to stay in bed here, and I would say that most patients are saying, my recovery was going great until they woke me up from anesthesia, but it gets better each day. Um, what we know is that for each day that a patient spends in bed, that often adds days in the hospital. It can add days in rehab. Um, and it also, it, it works on loss of strength and it makes it harder to, to sleep at night. So we know getting up and moving is a really important science-based uh, 
intervention that we can have. And one of the things that we've done to improve this is we've gotten pay, uh, patient ambulation assistance on the floor just dedicated to getting patients up and moving. And we're really excited about that. And the patients seem to uh, respond to that very well. And they feel better when they're up and moving. The next is diet. If you've come out of surgery with a nasal gastric tube in, the, the thing that you're dreaming most of is when is it that I can have something to eat and drink? And then we take that tube out and your meal feels like that on the left. You take a couple bites of food and it feels like you've eaten this much. And our encouragement is to get you eating and taking enough in. But what we found is that by taking the nasogastric tube out when it's no longer needed and getting you on a diet that actually can stimulate bowel function. And as Monica had mentioned in hers uh, presentation, it improves healing, it reduces rates of infection, and it improves mood and sense of well-being, and it helps the body to mobilize that fluid a little bit sooner uh, and also adds to energy and strength. The next one that it often most people don't think about is how we handle IV fluids after surgery. As I mentioned, most patients will leave heavier when they came in, and that's because that's a natural response that patients tend to hang on to fluid after a big operation. And what we're finding is if we give lots of fluid that adds to days oftentimes in bed because the legs get swollen. And if we know that swelling is visible on the outside, we know that that swelling occurs on the inside and it also impacts how quickly the bowels return to function as well as it has an impact on uh, functioning of heart and lungs. So by giving just what a patient needs, we tend to keep them from getting waterlogged and it gets patients up on their feet sooner and helps them recover quicker. And also it helps with the healing of the incision as well. The next one is narcotic pain control. Again, narcotics have been a part of recovery from surgery as long as surgery has been being done. But what we're finding is that they have a little bit of a deleterious effect as well. They produce nausea, can make things difficult to get back onto a diet. They keep you sedated and in the bed when we want you up and moving. So we know that if we can add some other things that don't have those impact on bowel function and level of sedation, that patients get good pain control but they're able to minimize how much uh, narcotic pain medication they're taking. So things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and Celebix, we're scheduling these routinely on patients now, as well as Tylenol. And we're also, uh, uh, anesthesia is incorporating muscle relaxers into those regimens. And what we're finding and what the data is showing us is that patients recover better, they have less side effects from the medication, they're back up and feeling normal again. Um, and that's a very important part. So we're incorporating all science into the science of pain control as well, and anesthesia is uh, helping us with that. And the last thing is tubes and drains. Tubes and drains make us feel better as clinicians. We're able to keep really close track on how much is going in and how much is coming out. But what we're finding is that keeps patients in bed. It makes you feel like a patient because you're all tangled up in everything. And so what we're finding is that we want to be very purposeful in our use of tubes and drains and that we're taking them out the at the time at which they're no longer needed. So taking NG tubes out within the first 48 hours after the operation, if possible, we'd like to do that. Getting Foley catheters out and getting surgical drains out that help us monitor anastomoses. <laughs> These are things that we're finding speed recovery and help uh, decrease pain and improve patient satisfaction. So in summation, an enhanced recovery after surgery is just a evidence-based multidisciplinary pathway that we have laid out to help reduce length of stay, to reduce complications, and to improve patients' uh, experience with the recovery. Not all two HIPEX are created equal, so we realize that there's work to be done on these pathways and that not all patients will follow as neatly through this pathway as I've described it, but all these principles are part of an efficient and safe recovery, and we look to keep improving that and reducing those times and getting patients back into their homes with their family members as quick as possible. Because when you're, own home, in, your, when you're in your own home, you tend to eat better, you sleep better, you move more, and you have better symptom control. So we'd like to say, again, thank you to all those patients who have gone through that difficult recovery process process and have helped inform our ability to help other patients recover better. So your fellow HIPEC patients, thank you for all the hard work you've done. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Nathan. Very well done. Appreciate it. Um, Aaron, if you can pull up the patient interview, that would be great. And we'll get rolling on that.
We met Jana in November of 2019 when she was diagnosed with two primary cancers, ovarian cancer for which she received chemotherapy treatment and then low-grade appendiceal cancer uh, and chemotherapy was not warranted at that time. She underwent the HIPEC with cytoreductive surgery via Dr. Levine and then she is about three years out now from her diagnosis, two years out from the HIPEC. We are so grateful that she's doing well. She gets surveillance every six months right now with CT imaging and labs, including CEA, CA125. I was completely healthy, and then one morning I woke up with abdominal pain. And I thought, just typical, you know, girl stuff. So I just went on, but it didn't go away. It lasted the whole day, and then I was sore the next day and ended up going to the emergency room at the insistence of some friends, went to the emergency room, and they scanned me and then could see tumors there. I went to another on oncologist because I had two primaries, went to another oncologist the next day. They drew blood and found out what my tumor markers look like, and they were through the roof. I was diagnosed in October of 2019 with appendiceal cancer, stage four, and with ovarian cancer, stage two. When I was diagnosed, my thoughts were about my family. That was my only thought, was my children and then my dad. I lost my mom to breast cancer 24 years ago, and I just didn't want them to have to go through that same trauma. Well, with two diagnoses, we saw several doctors and we went to several oncologists, different big facilities, and we came to Wake Forest Baptist. Dr. Levine came in and introduced himself, asked me all kinds of questions, let me ask questions, and then he turned to my family and asked them the same thing. You know, what concerns do you have? What questions do you have about HIPEC? What else do you need to know? And they were as much a part of this as I was. And when we left and sat down to lunch that day, I asked my family, I said, okay, what do you think? And everybody said, yeah, this is where we need to be. And this has been the best place we could have been. This has been a blessing for us because I feel like we, would not, we wouldn't have gotten this care other places. In October, I had surgery for the ovarian cancer. They later found the appendiceal cancer as well in the pathology reports, but because of the ovarian cancer, I underwent IV chemo, six rounds of IV chemo, and then I had a few months off. I came back to Baptist and I had the HIPEC surgery and the HIPEC treatment that here. The recovery was challenging, of course. Um, it, there was a lot of recovery in the hospital. We were told that I needed to walk, so I followed doctor's orders. I walked prior to the surgery, and I tried to walk about three miles a day. I did you know, everything I know everything they told me to do, I tried to do, and then went in for surgery. Um, the first day after, I was only able to move a few steps, like I'd move from the bed to the recliner and back, or I'd walk from the bed to my hospital door and back. And after days of learning to move again and getting through the, the discomfort of the surgery, I was able to start making laps. And I was told if I would make laps and do a lot of walking, that my recovery time would increase. So instead of being in the hospital for an extended period of time, I was there for about a week. I was there seven days and discharged. I was very excited. Yes, um, and then was able to return to work two months after surgery. So I felt very blessed. It was it was tough at first because I would you know would, didn't have the stamina I had before. I was still tired, but I was able to make it through the day and able to return to work full time. Probably the main complication was that my heart would race when I would walk. It started you know, right after surgery. And it lasted a few months, but after those few months and continuing to walk, that went away. 
I did have numbness in one leg, which I was told was a possibility, and that lasted for around a year or so, but has gone away, and now I don't have any side effects that I notice. I think we're coping as well as we can. It's day to day. You never forget you have cancer. My children will never forget that I have cancer, but because of HIPEC, because of the success of the surgery, I do feel like myself again. We're able to take vacations. We're able to go hiking together. It's like our family was before. You always have it in the back of your mind, but we're just learning to live our new normal. Thankful that we have this time together. Thankful that the surgery was an option. I guess the message to others would be find the best course of treatment for you, but don't sell yourself short. Check out all of your options. Make an informed decision. Don't be scared of something that's unknown. Hypex seemed so far-fetched to us. We had never heard of it. We knew nothing about it. We read about it and it seemed extreme. And then we listened to Dr. Levine and the team. They explained it to us. There was no doubt that's what we needed to do. They put our minds at ease. They let us know what to expect. And I have no regrets. That was what we needed to do. I just want to thank my care team for being on this journey with me. Thank you for giving us peace of mind. Thank you for giving my children and their mother for a few more years. And thank you for always putting our mind at ease, answering our questions, and making us all, family included, feel like this is important and that our lives matter to you. Well, that was great. <clears throat> Aaron, if you could tee up um, the next presentation, which is from Rebecca Harmon. Uh, Rebecca Harmon is a GI colorectal oncology nurse navigator for Atrium Wake Forest Baptist. Um, her presentation today is Navigation, Barriers to Care, Financial Issues, and Resources. Hi. Hi, my name is Rebecca Harmon, and I am the GI colorectal oncology nurse navigator at Atrium Wake Forest Baptist. And um, I am going to present today on what exactly a nurse navigator is and how we can assist um, throughout your process here at Atrium Wake Forest Baptist. A nurse navigator is a registered nurse. Um, we have oncology specific backgrounds and knowledge um, regarding your specific disease process. Um, we call patients ahead of time, uh, make sure they don't have any questions or concerns prior to their appointment. Um, we offer individualized care. We meet you at your initial appointment, um, provide you with our direct phone number. We're able to answer questions, um, help you with scheduling or coordinating care, um, referrals. Um, we just want to make sure that you have a direct point of contact um, in throughout our system if you were to need anything. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure you get scheduled quickly and appropriately. Um, we can also help with any questions you may have about your treatment plan. Um, so we do help with educating you about the process and what to expect. Um, we also assist with any type of supportive needs. If there are any barriers to you getting the care you need or getting surgery, uh, we wanna help you overcome those barriers. There are a lot of resources that our facility offers. So we you know, educate you about those. We want to be here for you to support you um, so that you can make the best decision um, for you going forward. So the most common barriers to care are transportation to and from appointments, social and cultural disparities, lodging needs. We have a lot of patients who come from out of state um, and financial concerns. So when a patient gets a serious diagnosis of appendiceal cancer, um, you know, their main concern is how, I, how am I going to pay for this? How am I gonna pay for treatment? How am I gonna pay for surgery? 
Um, we have a financial navigator department. Um, as a nurse navigator, we can place a referral to our financial navigators. They help patients navigate through the financial process of a new cancer diagnosis. Um, they do assist patients who have insurance. Um, they work with patients and their families um, and look at you know, the, the potential cost of treatment, potential cost of surgery, help them understand what their out-of-pocket expenses are gonna be, what their insurance will or will not cover. And they can also look and see if there's any assistance that is out there or grants um, that the patient could qualify for that could assist them. Uh, we also have a financial counseling department for patients who are uninsured. Um, another division um, we have is our population health navigators. Um, this is a group of people who are here to also support patients throughout this process. Um, they are culturally concordant. We have a bilingual navigator. Um, they work with specific diseases and specific patient populations. So we have a African-American navigator, a rural navigator, a Hispanic navigator, and an adolescent and young adult navigator. Um, these are underserved populations, and there are a lot of resources out there um, for our underserved populations that these navigators can assist with. Um, we work as a team and we utilize their knowledge and they also meet patients in clinic. They reach out via telephone. Um, they're able to place referrals as well. Um, like I said, just another means of support for our patients throughout this process. We encourage patients to ask questions. This is a difficult um, journey and a difficult process, and it's important to connect with other people who have had similar experiences. Um, we have a HIPEC ambassador program here. It is a group of people who have been through this. They've undergone the HIPEC procedure and the HIPEC surgery, and they're willing to talk with new patients um, and just explain their process and explain kind of what to expect. Um, that really helps patients um, kind of get through this, knowing that they have people um, who've been there um, and that they can rely on. We encourage patients to, you know, educate yourself, find organizations that have up-to-date resources, um, find a support group. Um, I've included a couple organizations that are very informative. Um, and then we don't want to forget about our caregivers. Yes, this is a diagnosis for the patient, but we want to make sure our caregivers get support too. Um, so caregiving.org, um, American Cancer Society, they all have really good resources for our caregivers. And to end, uh, we just want you to know that you're not alone. We're here to support you throughout this process. Um, and however we can do that, um, we have a really good team of people um, who are here to help you. Thank you. Okay, great job, Dr. Levin. Levine, I'll get that right one of these days. You guys are on mute. So, <clears throat> great job all day. Great job in your uh, regional session. Uh, do you have some follow-ups with uh, any any loose Q and A for today? Are there any questions that came that came in? I don't know if anything came in over the chat. We're happy to discuss them. Uh, I think. One of the things I'd like to say is on behalf of everybody who works here at Wake Forest, we just had our 30th anniversary of this HIPEC program, started December 30th, 1991, wow. which is well before most of their centers had even heard of HIPEC. Uh, and we've got, I think we salute, and this is something that, that you heard from Stephanie, you heard from Nathan, you heard from basically everybody on call, is we want to salute all the brave patients that have gone through this challenge with us. Uh, and we've uh, continues to be our honor to try and serve you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Levine. You and your entire team are doing outstanding work on behalf of patients and on behalf of the ACPMT Research Foundation. We certainly thank you for that hard work. And we also thank you for your ongoing collaboration, not only in helping and supporting patients, but helping and supporting us with our ongoing mission. So thank you very much.
greatly appreciated. Thank you for your support over all the years. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're adjourned and thank you all very much. Take care. Aaron, that's a wrap. All righty. Shut us down. Have a good one, Jim. Thanks. Take care.